Grüezi Ball. Guten Nachmittag, meine Damen und Herren. Leider äh, ist äh, hier heute nicht Professor Mudlu. So it will be me who will be teaching. Uh, this is lecture 21. What we are going to do today is uh, finishing with CMD processors. And then we will uh, talk about uh, a special type of CMD processors that are graphics processing units. But before we start, let me remind you the bachelor seminar that Professor Muldu will teach next fall semester. This will be very interesting for those of you who really like computer architecture. Uh, this is the, well, the agenda for today. We are in this last part, uh, other execution paradigms. You know that we started with the single cycle microarchitecture, multi-cycle microarchitecture, pipelining, uh, and other ways to increase the, product, the, the throughput in, in computers, like uh, out of order execution, uh, VLW, uh, VLIW, or uh, super scalar processors, right? Uh, right now, or in the last lecture, Professor uh, Moodle started with the Cindy processors, and now we are going to finish. These are your required readings. Uh, the first one, we, 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 actually we are going to talk today about the contents of these two. The first one, uh, it's about the CMD operations in uh, current uh, Intel processors, MMX technology. And the second one is about NVIDIA GPUs. So as I was saying, uh, this uh, lecture is about, is another way to uh, increase the uh, concurrency, to increase the instruction level parallelism in today's computers. So that's what we call the CIND processors. Uh, among the CIND processors, we find, as you already know, array processors and vector processors, and, and a special type of these are the GPUs. So let's take a look at uh, the CIND processor first. Uh, you might remember this slide. This is the Flynn's taxonomy. This is uh, in 1966, uh, Mike Flynn uh, published this paper where he categorized computing systems into four uh, main groups, right? The first one is CSD, single instruction, single data, uh, uh, computers uh, where we only operate on one uh, single data at a time and we only execute one instruction uh, on this data. The second category is uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data elements, that's what we are talking about. And here we find uh, array processors and vector processors. Then we have uh, MISD, multiple instruction, single data. There are not many of these, but something similar could be the systolic arrays or uh, also uh, microns, automata processors. And the last uh, category is uh, MIMD, uh, multiple instruction, multiple data. We are going to uh, talk today about GPUs, and we will see that there are many similarities between the programming model of the GPUs and the uh, MIMD uh, type of, uh, of uh, computing systems. But let, let's continue uh, recalling about CIMD processors. Remember that uh, in CIMD, one single instruction operates on multiple data elements, and typically we are going to have many processing elements. Uh, but there is what we call the uh, time-space duality, and it de this depends on what are the, what's the exact type of pro processor that we are talking about. You also remember this uh, slide, right? In this slide, we can see on the left-hand side an array processor, on the right-hand side a vector processor, Remember that the array processor is composed by several processing elements, an array of processing elements. Each of these, each of uh, them can execute uh, different instructions. But observe that the interesting thing here is that when we are executing this instruction in stream, load, uh, vector load, vector add, vector multiply, and vector store, uh, in the same cycle in the array processor, we are executing the same instruction. This for load operations that correspond to this first load instruction here are executed in the first cycle in the array processor. In the next cycle, we execute a different, sorry, we execute a different instruction, in this case, addition. So we have the same operation uh, in the same cycle, but different operations 
um, in different cycles and different operations in the same space. When we talk about space, uh, we mean uh, one of these processing elements. And then on the other hand, we have the vector processor. And as you can see in the vector processor, we uh, execute different operations at the same time. For example, in this particular cycle, uh, this uh, is a load, add, multiply, and store, and we are executing the four different operations at the same time. But the uh, vector functional units are specialized, as you can see. So, for example, this vector add unit always executes add operations. So that's why we say that it's the same operation uh, in the same space. You might also recall this slide, memory banking, uh, because as you see in the previous slide, we have several computing elements, a number of computing elements that is determined by our vector length, right? So ideally, it will be, uh, it will be nice to be able to access uh, the memory in parallel. If we have a vector length, let's say, equal 32, it would be nice to be able to perform 32 loads or 32 stores at the same time, right? So that's what we can do use when we use uh, interleaved or banked memories. You can see here an, an example of bank memory with 15 banks. Each of the banks has its own MDR and its own MIR. So this way, we are able to access the 16 banks at the same time. So that's what we can um, uh, we can achieve with uh, banked memory. So if we have M banks, we can have N memory accesses at the same time. But there are some issues here. No, not not uh, everything is perfect because strides are uh, very uh, important in the way uh, that we access uh, multi-bank memory. What's the stride? The stride is, as you will see, is the distance between two uh, consecutive ac consecutively accessed elements. Uh, everything will be okay uh, as long as the stride and the number of bank are relative primes. This means that they cannot, they are not divisible uh, be, uh, between them. Uh, we will see uh, an example soon. But, uh, and actually we are going to uh, see one example, how to uh, implement, how uh, a matrix multiplication maps on an architecture with a multi-bank memory. But first of all, we need to talk, probably this is something that you already know, about the storage of a matrix. You know that memories are linear, right? So when we access memory, we access a specific addresses, and these addresses are numbered in a linear way. Uh, what happens when we have to store in, in one of these memories uh, a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional uh, data structure? For example, a matrix, you know matrices have two dimensions, right? So there are two possibilities, at least two possibilities. One is row major and the other one is column major. What's the difference? Well, not much. The difference is that in the case of uh, row major, we are going to store the matrix by row. So we will first store uh, first row, uh, then we will start second row, and so on. In the column major layout, we will store it by columns. This depends on the uh, computing system and also depends on the, uh, for example, the programming language. Uh, you probably are already familiar with programming languages like uh, C or Fortran. C typically stores matrices in row major layout while Fortran does in uh, column major layout. So let's take a look at our first, uh, at our example. Like, uh, let's consider two matrices, A and B, that are uh, both stored in row major order. I'm going to uh, draw this quickly. Okay. Okay, uh, you can see, let's see. Okay, so we have our two matrices, A and B. Matrix A in your slide is something like this. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a five, yes, yeah, I think if I remember correctly, it's four times six is the size of the matrix. So this is element zero, one, two, up to element five, and here we have element six, seven, eight, 
uh, element, this is 11, and so on. And here, so it's this, this is going to be a matrix multiply of A times B. And this is our matrix B. In matrix B, you know that the number of rows is going to be the same as the number of columns. So this is going to be our element 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So this matrix has six rows and a certain number of columns, well, 10 columns. This is element 9. Okay, this is matrix B. How are these uh, matrices storing our linear memory? This is our memory. something like this, and this is going to be address A, the address where matrix A starts in memory. So this memory location is occupied by element zero of the matrix. We, I, I'm, I'm considering, uh, I think that I already uh, told you, I'm considering a row major layout, right? So the next element is one, the next element is two, and so on. So this will be element five, and next element is six, seven, etc. until 11, right? So as you can see, this is row zero, and this is row one. What about matrix B? Matrix B starts here, this is element zero in matrix B. This is element one. And element 10 is here. And element 20 will be here, right? So again, this is row zero. But observe that the elements that belong to the same column are not consecutive because we are using row major layout. So what's the problem here? The problem is that between these two elements who are consecutive in this column, in the first column of uh, matrix B, there is a stride. And this stride is 10 in this particular case. And here, there is also a stride 10. And as you know, when we start this a matrix multiplication A times B, what we are going to do is multiplying, so that we are going to calculate the dot product of this row and this column. So in the same, we are going to call this A0 and this B0. So in the same uh, dot product, we need to access one row of A and one column of B. And this means that we are accessing both matrices with different strides. In the case of A, everything is okay because we are accessing with a stride equal to one. So we just access consecutive elements. But in the case of B, we are accessing with a stride of 10. Is this a problem? Well, it will be a problem if, as we can see in this slide, the stride and the number of banks are not relative prime. And this happens many times, uh, typically because the number of um, banks in, uh, in, in current computers, computing systems is usually a uh, power of two. And uh, as you can uh, imagine, there are also many applications that use matrices, uh, which uh, the, the dimensions of which are uh, powers, powers of two as well. So, but well, in our particular example, uh, consider that we have uh, 10 banks. We have a memory with 10 banks. The problem here will be that we will have a 10-way bank conflict when accessing the, row, the, the elements in this column B0 of matrix B. Okay? 
But uh, uh, luckily, there are ways to minimize the bank conflict. One possibility is adding more banks, right? This is like the most straightforward uh, possibility. What's the problem with adding more banks? That we add in more complexity, more cost to the computing system. So ideally, we should be able to find other ways to do this, right? One possibility, another possibility is uh, using a better uh, data layout or doing some kind of data layout transformation. Is that possible? Well, maybe not always, but in some cases, or in the particular case of or A times B matrix multiplication, it is possible. We could transpose this matrix B. convert into something called BT, and in this BT, our layout would be something like this. Zero, 10, 50, and this is uh, one, two, etc. So now, B0, this first column, as you can see, the stride uh, between the consecutive elements of uh, B0 is one. So now, uh, this way, we could uh, avoid all possible uh, the bank conflicts when uh, executing this uh, matrix, matrix multi uh, multiplication. Okay, and the third possibility is using a better mapping of address to bank. There are many different proposals uh, to do this. One of them very, uh, one of the most uh, famous ones is the randomized mapping in this uh, paper by Bob Rowe, uh, published in 1991. So the idea here is that uh, the addresses are mapped to the banks in a random way. Uh, th this is still not a perfect solution, right? Because there might be some cases, some let's say pathological cases where uh, a program uh, could perform very bad with this uh, particular uh, randomized mapping. And actually that could be uh, even a bigger problem, program, uh, problem for the programmer because uh, the programmer might need to uh, find a way to uh, map uh, do some kind of data layout transformation, and this is going to be much more difficult if uh, the mapping between the addresses and the banks is uh, is more complex, right? Okay, uh, this regarding banks and strides, but now uh, sometimes we will see that uh, we are going to have irregular memory data access. Um, uh, so the, the, the matrices are going to be accessed in a way that is not strided, stride equal one or stride equal 10. Uh, it, they are going to uh, be accessed in a more irregular way. Um, in these cases, we should use indirection and we should use what are called a scatter and gather operations. Let me give you an example with this code. In this code, uh, we want to vectorize this loop. You, you see that there are like in different uh, iterations that are probably independent, right? So they could be vectorized, they could be executed in parallel in, in a vector machine. But uh, the problem that we have is that, um, uh, or, or, the, or the, uh, the interesting thing here, more than the problem, is that for this uh, array C, we are going to use indirect accesses. In which cases uh, does this make sense? Let's take a look at one example. This was, I think, actually already introduced by Professor Mutlu the other day, but let's take a look at this example. And the example is when we have a sparse data structures, like sparse vectors or sparse matrices. Let's consider we have a sparse vector, something like this. This is our vector C, and it turns out that this vector C, most of the elements of this vector C are equal zero. It only has three elements that are different than zero. This element here, this element here, and this element here. So the rest of elements are zeros, as you can see. Uh, so, one way, if we want to operate on this array um, C, one way to do it would be to go through all the uh, through all the uh, vector, uh, 
but the problem here is that probably we only need to operate on those elements that are different to, uh, than, uh, to zero, right? So, uh, this uh, element here that is equal to 4, this element that is equal to 10, and this element that is equal to 50. So it doesn't make any sense to go through the entire uh, vector if we only, maybe the, the, the array has, I don't know, one million elements and we only need to operate on three of the elements. So in these cases, uh, it makes sense to use uh, a scatter and gather approaches. And what we are going to, to use is an array, in this case it's an array D, that contains indices. This is an index array. And in this index array, what we are going to have are the uh, exact location, exact position in which the elements different than zero are uh, in the array. So maybe this is address 1001, maybe this is address 2050, and maybe this is address 3072. So here in array D, we will store 1001, 2050, 3072. So as you can see, the index, the index array points to the a specific location of the elements that are really useful. So every time we want to uh, uh, operate on this array, the first thing that we'll do is accessing uh, array D, the index array. So if we want to uh, uh, get this element from memory, we will first calculate and uh, uh, the, the, the address where this element is stored, that is C plus D0, D0, that is 1001, so, and this will give us number four. C plus 2050 will give us 10, and C plus 3072 will give us 50. So, this is one case where gather and scatter operations are useful. And you can see the code here in the slide. Uh, the, the, the vector uh, instructions for this uh, a specific, uh, but this vectorizable loop that we have here. So first of all, we have the uh, load. We load the indices of vector D. So we load the content of vector D into this register D. And then, we, and the, and then with register D, uh, register VD, and with RC, a scalar vector where we have the base, the, the base address of uh, uh, array C, we access array C and we load those elements into this vector array BC. This, uh, then we do the uh, vector load for uh, array B, then the addition, and finally we start the result. So this is an example of gather operation. We talk about gather because we read the elements from different locations. We read the elements from different locations and store them in the, the vector array, in this case, vector array uh, BC. Uh, we can also have a scatter operations. Uh, here you have an example of an, a scatter operation. This is uh, exactly the same, but instead of reading, what we are doing is writing. We are storing. So you see that <clears throat> we have this <clears throat> index vector, the contents of in the index vector are 0 to 6, 7, and these are the positions in the output array where we are going to store these values here. So in address base plus 0, we store 314. In address base plus 2, we store uh, five, uh, 6.5. Okay? Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> Let's continue with the CIND processors. Um, you already know what uh, an um, array processor and a vector processor is. As the slide says, this is a distinction uh, of uh, purists. Um, current CIND processors are uh, more a combination of both array and vector processors, and GPU are a good example of that. Again, we have here the uh, difference between array processors and vector processors. In array processors, we have the uh, same operation at the same time, different operations in the same space. In the vector processor, we have different operations at the same time, same operation in the same space. 
uh, we could have something intermediate, something and combination of both. And uh, consider this vector operation, this vector add, where the input operands are A and B, and the output operand is a vector, uh, vector uh, array, ve uh, no, so vector register C. If we have one single pipeline functional unit, the different uh, the different elements of these three, uh, so we will operate on the different elements of this, these three uh, vector arrays in a, way, in a way like this, right? We, we want to calculate C0, we will have to input A0 and B0, and we will go through this pipeline, this uh, pipeline functional unit, and we will obtain uh, the result for C0, and then we will obtain the result for C1 and for C2, etc. So we are achieving parallelism here, or concurrency, but uh, only in time. We can do this in time and in space if we have more than one uh, pipeline functional unit. In this example here, we have four pipeline functional units. And now consider a case, well, the, the same as this specific example here. Consider that your vector length is 28, but you only have four pipeline units. But we, 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 when we talk about these units, we, call about, uh, we talk about lanes. We call each of these uh, units a lane. So if we have 28 uh, elements in our vector register, our vector length is 28, but we only have four uh, lanes, how are we going to execute these 28 operations on these four vector lanes? So what we do is something like this. Here we will calculate C0, here C1, C2, C3, and then four, five, six, seven, et cetera. And this is something more similar to current um, CND processors like GPUs. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, the structure of a vector unit. And as you can see, each of these components is what is called a lane. In this particular case, this lane contains two uh, um, functional units. I mean, this could be the vector functional unit and the operands are going to be stored in these uh, vector registers. This is the entire register file, and we partition the register file, and each uh, of the parts is going to be uh, assigned to each of the um, lanes in a way that elements zero, so A0, B0, and C0 are here. Uh, elements one are here, two, three, four, Five, etc. Let's take a closer look at this. How how are these uh, executed on the on the hardware? Let's in this particular example, we are going to consider uh, 32 elements per, per vector register. So our vector lane is 32, and we consider that we only have eight lanes. So if we want to, and uh, as you can see, uh, we, we are going to have three units: load unit, multiply, add. Probably can have a fourth unit that would be the the uh, a store unit, right? So uh, in the first cycle, we launch, we issue this instruction load for uh, our first operation. Uh, in this operation, we operate on 32 elements because our vector register has uh, 32 elements, but we only have four lanes. So observe that, uh, sorry, eight lanes. So observe that the eight first load operations are perform on the first cycle, the next eight load operations in the second cycle, and so on. So we need four cycles to execute the entire vector load instruction. Um, in the next cycle, because uh, as soon as we got the results, for I mean, as soon as we access memory and got the elements that we need to read from memory for these eight lanes, we can start the next operation that is a multiplication. So in the next cycle, we can issue this multiply instruction. And in the multiply instruction, again, we can execute eight multiplications at the same time in the first cycle, eight in the second cycle, and so on. And here, the next operation that is an addition, and here again, um, a load for the next 32 elements, if we are operating on an array, uh, multiply, and add. Observe that in any of these cycles where we are actually using 
the three units at the same time observe that we are able to execute uh, 24 operations, right? And it, actually, if you count the total number of operations here is 192. We are able to execute 192 operations in just 10 cycles. So this is a lot of instruction level parallelism, right? Okay. Let's now talk about uh, how to vectorize code, because this is something, uh, I mean, that's something that we uh, have to consider, right? For now, we know, uh, we have an idea how these, uh, these uh, vector processors or array processors are composed, but now we need to start thinking about how to uh, exploit these vector or array processors. How do we have to write our code? And this is what we call the code vectorization. Uh, this is something that uh, likely uh, many compilers, most of compilers uh, can do nowadays uh, automatically, but it's also something that the programmer, we as a programmers can do. And uh, as you can guess, if uh, it's in some cases it might be more difficult to extract this parallelism and a programmer can always, uh, a good programmer can always do better than a, a compiler. So let's consider that uh, we initially have this uh, sequential code as you know, this sequential code will, will be executed like this. We need to first load element A, load element from B. We add them, and then we store in the corresponding position in C, and then we go to the next iteration, right? So one thing that a compiler or a programming could do is vectorizing this code. Why can, what can we do that? Because the, um, the different iterations are independent, so there are no loop carry dependencies. And uh, this uh, allows us to vectorize the code. Um, so that each of these uh, operations load can be packed into uh, vector instructions. So this would be a vector load, then another vector, vector load to load uh, element from B, then we have a vector add to add the registers, uh, vector register A and vector register B, and store the result in uh, with this vector, in, vector store instruction in the uh, corresponding um, um, memory location where array C is stored. So uh, in summary, um, vector and CND machines are good at exploiting regular data level parallelism. They operate uh, on different data elements, but they perform the same uh, operation. Uh, we can have a performance improvement because we can parallelize or we can vectorize the code. But it is true that we have to keep in mind that not uh, every code is going to be parallelizable or vectorizable. You uh, already know how to program it, right? Uh, probably C, and if you analyze the code that you have previously, previously written, you will see that there are many sections of this code that can be parallelized, that can be vectorized, but other uh, sections of the code, you will, you will see that they, will, they are inherently uh, sequential, so they are not parallelizable, and we have to keep in mind that uh, and and law uh, will limit the maximum uh, speed that, that we can obtain from the parallelization. Um, yeah, uh, that's why uh, computer designers always, uh, even though they design parallel computers, vectorized computers, they always take a lot of care of what's the performance of scalar operations, as, uh, for example, Cray-1, uh, which was the fastest scalar machine at its time. And there are many... Um, um, examples of CMD operations in, in uh, current uh, instruction sets ar set architectures. For example, in Intel machines, in IBM, PowerPC, uh, in ARM, etc. And now, before uh, the break, we are going to see one example, uh, the example of CMD operations, uh, MMX operations uh, in uh, Intel architectures. Um, yeah, where are we? Okay. So as you know, single instruction, multiple data inst uh, extension instruction operate on multiple pieces of data at once. So it, um, uh, Intel engineers noticed uh, in the 90s, in 1995 or 1996, they noticed that there were many applications that had a lot of parallelism where we had uh, repeated uh, operations on different data elements, right? So that's why it, it was possible to uh, include uh, seen the instructions in uh, the instruction set architecture. 
uh, these uh, particular uh, instructions are very useful in some specific applications, for example, multimedia. That's why we also talk about multimedia extensions and graphics. Um, essentially, the idea is something like what you can see in the slide. Uh, instead of using these two registers with 32 bits, instead of using them as a single floating point operand or as a single 32-bit integral operand, what we do is that we divide them into four parts, and each of the, these parts is 8-bit. Eight, uh, 8 bits or 16 bits is uh, enough number of bits for the majority of uh, multimedia or graphics applications. So that's why uh, they could do this. So uh, this, for ex this is an example of pack at eight, in which what we do is that the 32 bits are uh, divided into four parts. Each of the parts represents one um, vector element. So this is treated as a vector register. And with this P uh, at eight, what we do is adding uh, each of the um, uh, elements in the vector register. So the result in uh, register 2 will be uh, A3 plus B3, A2 plus B2, and so on. So let's take a closer look at the Intel Pentium MMX operations. Um, what uh, uh, what uh, the MMX technology defined, and what, what that's something you can read in this paper, is that each of the 64-bit registers could be used like uh, um, vector registers. So um, depending on the opcode of the operation that were, uh, of the instruction where we use each of these registers, uh, the, the contents of the register will be treated as eight 8-bit eight bytes or four 16-bit words or two 32-bit uh, double words or one single 64-bit quad word. And as you can see in this figure uh, on the left. Let's uh, take a look at an example of what we can do with uh, these uh, MMX instructions. So this is uh, what is called image overlaying. Uh, here, this is, uh, I mean, you, you uh, already know this, right? This is, for example, what uh, in the TV, uh, what they do when, uh, for the weather forecast, when you have like the weatherman uh, and at the back of the, the weatherman, uh, you can see the, the, the map of uh, Switzerland or the Zurich, uh, et cetera, with the clouds, sun, little suns, et cetera. So um, this is something that is done with uh, a chroma, that is the, the, the uh, one single color background. In this specific case, even though you cannot see it because the slide is black and white, in this particular case, we consider that the chroma is blue. So you can see here the woman, who could be the weather woman, and this background around her is completely blue. So what we want to do is overlay the shape of the woman on this uh, background. This is a blossom, uh, as you will read in the, in the paper. So the result will be something like this. So how can we uh, do this? In a sequential code, we will do something uh, as this simple code. We go through the entire image from i equals zero to i um, uh, equal image size minus one. And then if the particular value of the pixel is equal to blue, what we will do in the new image is that we replace it with the uh, pixel that occupies the same position in the blossom black background. If it's not blue, else, in the new image, we simply uh, copy the pixel of the original image. So that would be a pixel belonging to the shape of the woman. So if we want to uh, implement this using uh, MMX instructions, what we are going to do is, first of all, we need to calculate a bit mask. The way we calculate this bit mask is using this specific MMX instruction. This is packed compare equal uh, byte where we compare the contents of MM1 and MM3. MM1, as you see, is all the bytes are equal to blue. 
whatever, however the, the blue color is uh, encoded uh, as one and zeros. And in MM3, what we have are the pixels from the original image, from this original image with the, uh, the woman and the uh, blue chroma. So we compare these two. For example, in this case, pixel X7 is not blue, so the output is zero. This one is not blue, the output is zero. This case, it is blue, so the output is uh, all ones. So this way we obtain this bit mask. So now, using the bit mask, that's, uh, you can see that it's storing MM1, what we are going to do is we add the bit mask with the blossom image, I, and with the women's image. This way we obtain some partial results that are storing MM4 and MM1, and using a pack or, we combine, we merge the two images. This is your code. You can take uh, a closer look, um, um, well, well, especially when you read the paper, of course. You see here that the first uh, two instructions are MOV uh, Q. So what we do here is that we access, we load uh, eight pixels from the uh, woman's image, and here we load other eight pixels from the uh, blossom image, then here we uh, are uh, executing, uh, we, here we are uh, uh, using this uh, packed compare equal byte that, uh, w uh, that we use to obtain the bit mask, and then we have the P and, and the P and N, uh, and finally the uh, packed OR that we have used uh, in the example uh, here. Okay, um, because I think, yeah, we still have four more minutes before the break. Let me start with the second part, that is a, a graphics processing units. Uh, I will introduce it as soon as um, we hear the bell. Uh, we will have our 15-minute break, and then we will continue. So we start talking about graphics processing units, GPUs. Um, as, you, as you're going to see, uh, graphics processing units are seen the engines at the underneath. Um, they have an um, uh, instruction pipeline that operates as a CINDI pipeline. But the good thing here is that we are not going to program them as CINDI processors, as we have just seen with these CINDI extensions in Intel architectures. But we are going to program them using threads, um, not CINDI instructions, uh, uh, you will see. Um, in order to understand this, we are going to use the same code, this for loop, uh, C equal A plus B, that we have been using before. Um, but before that, we need to distinguish between two important concepts here. One of them is the programming model, which is a software concept, and the other one is the execution model, which is a hardware concept. So let's talk about programming model and about hardware execution model. The programming model refers to how the programmer expresses the code. So this uh, is related to the way that any of us as programmers will write the code, will uh, express some particular uh, algorithm um, to uh, implement an application. And you already know that there, there are uh, different ways of doing this. Uh, one possibility is the sequential code same as, for example, C or Fortran are sequential. You write the different instructions to execute operations that are, uh, that are intended to be um, processed one after the other. Or we could do some kind of uh, parallel, data parallel uh, code writing, right? Like, for example, if we use these uh, SIMD MMX instructions that we just uh, we have just seen, or we could use um, data flow programming model or multi-threaded programming model. But what's the execution model? It's not exactly, it's not the same. The execution model is the way that the hardware is going to execute the code uh, underneath. 
So, and there are different ways of doing this. You're already familiar with uh, out of order execution, you already know vector processors, array processors, data flow processors, etc. We could potentially, uh, we can write sequential code and this sequential code can be executed on a pipeline processor or an out of order processor or a super scalar processor. You already uh, know how this work. Or um, we could even write some sequential code and a compiler could do a transformation, could convert into vectorizable code, as we have mentioned before, and then we could execute this on a vector processor or an array processor. So um, this, these are like the two pillars, right? Like the difference between programming model and execution model. Here you have uh, some ex uh, two examples that I, I've mentioned this one. We could uh, write code, sequential code that will be executed in some way in an out of order processor, or we could write uh, some kind of uh, SPMD, some kind of parallel programming model uh, that would be later executed on the CIND processor, uh, CIND processor, and that that is uh, uh, the example of the GPU. Let's take a break, 15 minutes, and we continue after that. So, we were in the in this slide, and we uh, started to talk about the difference between the programming model and the hardware execution model. This is actually, uh, in the, the, the next slides you will see, uh, we will see or we will discuss several examples of this and uh, as you will see this is something um, very useful when you uh, start uh, programming for different architectures because uh, um, also it will be, so uh, having a good understanding of this will be also essential to uh, be able to write optimized code for the different architectures. Um, we uh, said that uh, programming model is uh, some um, software concept. It's uh, the way, it refers to the way that the programmer expresses the code and the execution model that is more a hardware concept uh, refers to how the hardware executes the code underneath. Let's start uh, discussing um, several examples. Um, you uh, already know this code. This is the for loop that we are uh, using as a running example uh, throughout this lecture. We have our for loop, uh, n iterations. Uh, we read n elements from uh, array A or vector A, n elements uh, of uh, B. We add them and store the result in C. And we could express these uh, in different ways. Um, the most uh, naive and straightforward way is the scalar sequential code um, as it is uh, represented here uh, on the uh, figure on the left. Um, uh, we uh, would execute all the uh, successive iterations, iteration one, iteration two, and in each of these iterations we uh, perform two loads, one at, and one store, but now we are going to see uh, three different programming, op programming options uh, that will allow us to exploit the instruction level parallelism that is present in this sequential code. The first one is the sequential or CSD uh, programming model. The second one is the data parallel or SIMD programming model. And the third one is multi-threaded. Uh, we can talk about MIMD or SPMD, as you will see. So let's start from the beginning. Let's start with programming model one, the sequential or CSD. Uh, it's uh, the way we are going to write the code is as is, right? We would write sequential code that, like this uh, short sequence of uh, C code. And how is it going to be executed on our architecture? If this is a CSD architecture, there might be different ways. For example, we can use a pipeline processor. In a pipeline processor, as you know, we are able to issue several uh, instructions, one after the other. Uh, in some cases, we might need to start or we might need to forward if there are data dependencies, right? Um, but uh, that's what we can do with this code. We can uh, first fetch the first load instruction, 
then we decode it, then we uh, access uh, registers and uh, go to the uh, AM, execute the stage, et cetera. And at the same time that we are decoding the first load, we can fetch the second load and so on. So this is a pipeline execution. You already know the pipeline processor. Another possibility is also using an out-of-order execution processor. And as you know, in the uh, out-of-order processor, we can execute independent instructions as soon as the, uh, the, the operands are ready. Uh, we can have, in this particular case of this loop with n different iterations, we could have uh, different iterations in the instruction window because um, they because they are uh, independent iterations and they could be executed in parallel in the uh, multiple functional units that our out of further processor can have. Um, this is uh, something similar to unrolling a loop. Uh, we could say that out of further processors uh, unroll loops uh, dynamically in a, in, a, in a hardware way. Have you? Uh, heard about loop unrolling before? Loop unrolling is um, one of a very useful uh, compiler optimization technique. And also as programmers, we can do loop unrolling. Um, let me show you an example for this specific code. So, this is our C code for or for loop i equals zero i less than n i plus plus. And here we have something like C i equal B i plus A i. So Observe that uh, writing code in this way is very convenient, right? Because we just need to write the for loop and then we write uh, the operation that, that we want to uh, execute. But the truth is that the way this is going to be uh, executed on the hardware, you know that the, what the compiler is going to do is there will be a sequence of instructions. You, you, you already know MIPS assembly, right? For example, if it, this, was this was going to be executed on a MIPS machine, we will have here a load war, load war, uh, some kind of add, and then a store war. And then we will need to have some jump probably here so that we start and then maybe one, one branch equal uh, instruction or branch not equal, depending on the way we implement this, um, uh, in order to, uh, to terminate the loop. But one good thing here, one, something that the compiler can do uh, or, or the programmer can do is, especially in the cases where uh, this upper bound of the um, code of the uh, uh, loop is constant, it is possible to unroll and enrolling consists of automatically converting this for loop into a sequence of C0 equal B0 plus A0, C1 equal B1 plus A1, etc., until C n minus one equal B n minus one plus A n minus one. Okay? So as you know, if you're the programmer and you need to write this, I don't know, n equal 1,000 times, you better write a for loop. But if you are uh, going to execute this or this on um, uh, a specific uh, processor, you better execute this because in this way you are avoiding the, for example, branches that you have here or the index calculation that you will also need in this uh, assembly code. Okay? So that's loop unrolling. And uh, as I said, uh, out of order processors uh, do some kind of uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, hardware unrolling. And the uh, last possibility would be uh, superscalar 
or uh, very long instruction word processors uh, that allow us, uh, allow us also to uh, fetch and execute multiple instructions per cycle. So this is programming model uh, sequential. We write our code in a way that will be executed on a CZ uh, computing system. The second programming model is the data parallel or SIMD. So uh, here, uh, we have the same baseline. We have the same, initially we have the same sequential code, but there is, there is one realization here, is the fact that each of these iterations is independent. And because each of these iterations is independent, we can vectorize or we can parallelize. So we can do something like this. We uh, should be able to execute um, the uh, different iterations in parallel and the programmer or the compiler will generate SIMD instructions to execute um, different iterations at the same time. So this would be a one vector instruction, one vector load instruction. This would be the uh, vector load A, uh, read from A and store in V1, vector register one. This would be the second uh, vector load instruction this is a vector add, and this is a vector store. So as soon as we uh, have this code, this vector, vec uh, vectorized or parallelized code, we can execute this on a CINDI processor, and as the, pro as the ones that we have discussed in the first part of the uh, lecture, as a vector, array, a vector processor or array processor. And the third one, is the uh, multi-threaded programming model. Again, the realization is that each iteration is independent, but now, instead of generating vector instruction, instructions from the different iterations, what we are going to do is generating one thread for each of these iterations, one thread of execution for each of these iterations. And this is something that could be executed on a multiple instruction, multiple data matching as a multiprocessor, or also uh, on a, a GPU. This, is, this particular model is also called single program multiple data, because observe that each of these parallel threads that are going to execute each of the different iterations um, is actually running the same program, this simple program with two loads, one at and one store, on different data uh, instances, on different data elements. And this can be executed on a uh, MIMD machine, but can also be executed on a SIMD machine. And that's what GPUs does. Uh, actually, uh, we, when we talk about GPUs, uh, we don't only, not only talk about SPMD, single program multiple data, and SIMD machine, we also talk about SIMT, single instruction multiple thread matching. This is, let's say, uh, NVIDIA uh, terminology, but uh, it's uh, essentially the same as a uh, SPMD programming model. So the GPU is a SIMD or SIMT matching, except that uh, the SIMD instructions are not exposed to the programmers. As you will see, uh, the programmer uh, doesn't need to write vector instruction. The programmer will write programs that are executed by some threads. And each of these threads uh, will have its own context, as we will see. Uh, well, actually, uh, the threads, what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, group them in uh, sets or collections of threads that are called warps or wavefronts. Uh, we will use throughout the rest of the lecture mo mostly the uh, term warp, that is uh, NVIDIA terminology, but in AMD uh, terminology, uh, they call it uh, wavefront, but it's essentially the same concept. So a warp is a SIMD operation formed by the hardware. In our programming model, we are going to write this single program multiple data uh, code where we define several threads. Uh, each of the threads execute the same program on multiple data instances, uh, but what 
afterwards the code, uh, the hardware is going to do is going to take these threads, is going, the hardware is going to um, pack these different threads into warps, and the warps are going to be executed as, is, as if they were SIMD instructions or SIMD operations. So the warp is a set of threads that execute the same instruction. And actually, they are going to have all the threads uh, in this warp are going to have the same program counter. So here, instead of having vector instructions, as we mentioned before, for this vector load, vector load, vector add, what we have here is one warp that executes the first load instructions. You see uh, warp zero at certain program counter, PCX, and then warp zero at PCX plus one, and then uh, this addition executed by one warp, warp zero in this case, and this uh, instruction is in PC x plus 2, and the store is executed by warp 0 at uh, PC x plus 4. So uh, this is how we are going to execute the SPMD, the single program multiple data, on a SIMD machine. Let's... Uh, um, let's continue and take a, a closer look. Uh, let's uh, continue with this comparison of SIMD and SIMT. So SIMD is a, sec a, a single sequential, inst sequential instruction stream on of SIMD ins uh, instructions. So we have one vector instruction, for example, vector load instruction. We have second vector load instruction. Then we have a vector add instruction. However, in SIMT or the uh, SPMD programming model, we have multiple instruction streams of scalar instructions. And this SIMT or uh, SPMD has two main advantages. The first them is that we can treat each thread separately. And the second one, we will discuss it later, is that we can group threads into warp uh, flexibly. So let's start with the first one. Uh, we can treat each thread separately, so we can execute each thread independently on any type of a scalar pipeline, um, and this is what is called the MIMD processing. So, um, for now, we are going to assume that a warp consists of 32 threads, so the way that we are going to use these 32 threads, these warps, is uh, by interleaving them. We are going to define warps of 32 threads, and these warps of 32 threads are going to be executed on, on, on some kind of SIMD pipeline. So let's, for example, consider that the code that we have there on the uh, top right, this code uh, has 32K iterations, because we know that all warps are 32 uh, threads. We will need how many warps? We will need 1K warps, right? So the way these warps are going to be executed on the hardware is in an interleaved way. We will talk about fine-grain multi-threading of warps. And here you can see uh, one example for uh, uh, this, um, um, this uh, simple program. First of all, in corresponding to iteration one and iteration two, we could have iteration one, iteration two, up to iteration 32, right? Because you know that the you already know that the warp has 32 threads, so the 32 first iterations are going to be executed by this warp zero. So um, when it's time for warp zero to uh, execute this first load instruction uh, that is stored in PCX, what we do is um, uh, issuing one instruction for warp zero, and this instruction will perform 32 loads in parallel. And then uh, we will issue the next instruction, maybe for the same warp or probably for a different warp. So in this case, for example, this would be uh, warp one, instruction zero, right? Or instruction at PC equal X, um, that is the first load for warp one. And maybe the next instruction that is 
issued in the SIMD pipeline is this add instruction for warp 20. And this add instruction is stored in PC X plus two. Uh, obviously, if we are going to execute this add instruction for warp 20, it's because we have issued and we have executed uh, this load and this load for warp 20 before issuing uh, this add instruction, right? Um, so uh, at some point before the execution of this first load for warp zero, we could have executed uh, this uh, vector load I and mean, this uh, load instruction for warp 20 and then um, the second load instruction for one warp 20. And finally, when these two are completed, uh, we can execute this add for warp 20. Is that clear? Okay, this is what we call uh, fine grain multi-threading of warps. It's, uh, as you see, the, the concept is similar to the uh, fine grain multi-threading that Professor Moodley explained um, uh, in previous lectures, but now, we applied it to um, SIMD uh, processors to, 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 or, or a specific case of SIMD processors that are the uh, GPUs. So uh, we have already mentioned that, but uh, here again, you see the definition of warp, a set of threads that execute the same instruction. And also you can see clearly in this figure that all the threads belonging to the same warp share the PC. So, the 32 threads in each warp will be exactly in the same program counter. And, uh, and, and, and the truth is that in the uh, hardware, in the SIMD processor, in the SIMD core, where we execute uh, these warps, we only have one program counter per warp. Uh, by the way, the name warp comes from the definition. If you go to the dictionary, you will see that a warp is defined as the threads that run lengthwise in a Bowen fabric. Uh, it's uh, um, well the analog, uh, the analog between uh, threads uh, in the Bowen fabric and threads of execution. Okay, let's take a, clo a closer look at the hardware. This is a high-level view of a GPU. And uh, you can see that uh, there is, well, we have our memory here, uh, GDDR3 or GDDR5 in most recent uh, or even HPM or HPM2 in most recent uh, GPUs. We have an interconnection network and uh, through this interconnection network, the different shader cores can access memory. Each of these shader cores, this, uh, the name shader core uh, comes from the uh, graphics uh, um, uh, environment, but uh, here we will simply talk about SIMD cores. Uh, each of these uh, cores is composed by something, uh, these, these different elements that you see here. Uh, we have a program counter, and actually you already know that we will have as many program counters as warps we are going to execute in this um, CND processor. We have an instruction cache that uh, the warps are going to use to fetch the next instruction to execute. We have some decode uh, unit to decode the, the instructions. And then we have these scalar pipelines. Observe that this is actually a vector or array processor. It's a SIMD processor. But uh, we consider that each of these, so is, is this SIMD processor is composed by uh, several scalar pipelines. And each of these scalar pipelines, as we will see, corresponds to one vector lane. You are already familiar with the concept of vector lane. Let's take a little bit uh, more detailed look at this um, core that we have here. By the way, the name that this cores uh, receive in NVIDIA architecture is streaming multiprocessor. In AMD architectures is compute unit. For us, it's uh, just like a SIMD core. Let's call it SIMD core. So uh, in this SIMD core or this SIMD pipeline, we're going to issue instructions for the different warps that we uh, have in, your, in our uh, SIMD core. So for example, here you see uh, thread warp seven. So this is warp seven, warp eight, warp three. And in one particular point in time, what we will uh, issue for this warp seven will be 
one specific instruction for this warp 7, for example, one load or one add or one multiply. As you can see in the pipeline, we have an instruction fetch stage, we have a decode stage, then we have a register file, we have a partition register file, same as we, um, this, uh, we saw before in the uh, vector processors, then we have our execute stage, and then here what we have is a memory stage. This is a memory stage uh, uh, within the CIND pipeline, what we have is a data cache. The cache, as you, cache, as you know, is an on-chip memory that is uh, fast uh, access. Uh, but the problem is that in some cases, we might not have all the uh, values, all the uh, operands that we need to use in the dcache. So in that case, we will have a miss. And if we have a miss, we will have to go through the rest of the memory hierarchy. Probably, we will have to uh, go to the main memory, to this uh, GDDR memory that you see uh, in the previous slide. And obviously this will take longer, right? Actually, I mean, just to give you an idea of how many cycles do we need to uh, go through all these stages if our operands are in the dcache, maybe it's 24 cycles. Uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, typical values of, G, of um, um, current GPUs. So maybe it's 24 cycles, but if I have a miss here, I will have to go to the memory, and if I have to go to memory, maybe it will take 600 cycles or something like that. So what are we going to do? Unfortunately, in this CIMD pipeline, we don't have uh, forwarding units or something similar. So we'll, we will have to stall the pipeline for this specific warp. But the good thing is that this is a fine-grained multi-threading architecture. And uh, for that reason, while for one specific warp, let's say warp zero, we are waiting for a memory access, we can keep this pipeline busy by executing instructions from other warps, maybe warp one, warp two, warp three, and so on. So while we are waiting for the operands uh, to uh, be retrieved from memory, we can keep executing warps that are uh, taking advantage of uh, all these resources that we have in the CND pipeline. And this is something that um, uh, will actually happen uh, in GPUs because uh, we are going to use them for a very, um, uh, with, let's say, embarrassingly parallel uh, operations where we have many, many uh, input data elements, like, for example, in images where we have millions or, or hundreds of thousands of pixels or very big matrices. Um, so um, it's um, something that... Um, that um, uh, I mean, we, are, we are going to take advantage of that on, on current GPUs. Okay, uh, now let's take again a look. It says, recall the slide, because you already know this slide, but now instead of talking about vector, how to execute a vector uh, instruction on a specific hardware, now we go to the particular case of the warp, right? And now for a 32-thread warp that is going to execute this add, operation, we could do it in something like this, a uh, pipeline functional unit where we can have um, concurrent execution or, or parallel execution in the, in the um, uh, time axis. Or we can have something like this. We can have several, in this case, four pipeline functional units so that we have uh, uh, parallelism, and we exploit the parallelism not only in time, in these pipeline units, but also in space. So now let's go to the particular case of a warp. Let's consider that our warp has 32 threads, but we only have four of these functional units. We only have four vector lanes. So what is what we are going to do? We will first execute the addition for thread zero, one, two, and three, and then we will pipeline the addition for thread four, five, six, seven, et cetera, until uh, the uh, thread 31, until all the 32 threads are um, uh, pipelined in these um, uh, functional units. And again, 
this slide now also uh, more particular for the case of the threads. Now, uh, in each of these vector lanes, we have some registers and some of these registers are for, so uh, the, 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 these registers are divided uh, into the different threads that are going to be executed um, in this um, vector lane. So these are the registers for thread zero, thread one, thread two, thread three, and so on. And also, now, instead of talking about SIMD parallelism, we talk about warp instruction level parallelism. But again, it's the, uh, same, the same story. Remember that here we said, maybe your vector length is 32, but we only have eight, lengths, eight, eight, eight lanes. So now what we say is we have 32 threads per warp, but we only have eight lanes. How do we execute the 32 threads in eight lanes? We will do something like this. Uh, we first launch the load instruction or issue the load instruction for the eight first threads of the 32 thread warp, then for the next eight threads, then for the next eight threads and so on. At the same time, or maybe one cycle later, we can issue uh, the multiply instruction, in this case for a different warp, for warp one, and then for warp two, uh, we issue the add operation to the add unit, and then the load for uh, warp three, and load for, uh, uh, multiply for warp four, and um, um, add for warp five. Uh, one important thing to uh, keep in mind here, uh, in uh, current GPUs, we cannot issue one multiply and until the load operation, uh, the previous load operation has completely finished. So that's why, as you see, this is load for warp zero and this is multiply for warp one. So we can only launch multiply for uh, warp zero when the uh, complete warp has got the results from the load unit, has uh, access memory using the load unit. Okay. Um, well, now we have some uh, slides to introduce more or less the way that GPUs are programmed, but uh, we will have time tomorrow uh, to talk about this. Uh, the way uh, when, when we program the GPU using uh, the specific programming language that uh, is used to program the GPUs, we need to make use of a thread ID because depending on the thread ID, uh, we, uh, so each of the threads is going to know what element and what registers uh, it will have to access. But uh, we will take a closer look at this tomorrow. Uh, here is just one example, uh, very, very uh, simple code or uh, CPU code. Remember this for loop C equal A plus V. And this is uh, CUDA code. CUDA is the uh, programming language for NVIDIA GPUs. And this is the way it looks. As you can see here, we read uh, array A, here we read array B, and here we perform the addition. And um, all these uh, memory accesses to A, B, and C are dependent on this TID. And as you can see, this TID is calculated here. And uh, it's different for each of the threads that are executed on the GPU. We will see this tomorrow. Here you see uh, this a little bit uh, with uh, a little bit more detail, uh, the CPU program and the corresponding GPU program. But now let's continue um, with, uh, with the, uh, a specific uh, implementation uh, of the hardware of the GPUs. So um, in order to uh, finish with this uh, part, uh, let's compare the WAR-based SIMD with the traditional SIMD. In traditional SIMD, there is one single thread, and in this single thread, we have a sequential instruction execution. But this sequential instruction execu execution is execution of SIMD instructions, of vector instructions. In the case of the WAR-based SIMD, we have like different scalar threads that are grouped in a CD manner, that are grouped in a warp, and then they are executed on the hardware. Uh, but the threads can be treated independently. So it's not SIMD, it's single program, multiple data. Um, 
we said before, it's a programming model, CMD program multiple data or single procedure multiple data is a programming model rather than, rather than an execution model or a computer organization. Um, the, the, the different threads execute independently, but at some point it will be possible to synchronize them. We will talk about this also tomorrow. And uh, the different instruction streams, the different programs, the different procedures work on different data and execute or can execute potentially a different control flow path. Okay, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, going to talk about that, about the uh, possible different control flows in the execution of a warp. Um, and this uh, brings us to the second of the major advantages of the CMT uh, machine, be, uh, where we can group threads into warp flexibly. Uh, where, where is this going to be useful? Well, in some cases where in our program, in our uh, single program, uh, multiple data paradigm, uh, we have conditional control flow instructions. You know that conditional control flow instructions are used to uh, define different control paths in our code, uh, if else, for example. So uh, let's consider that we have like a code like this, where these are different uh, basic blocks, and here we make some decision, if else, depending on the uh, value of a certain variable, for example, we will go through this path or we will go through this path. With the SPMD programming model, it is possible for different threads to follow different control paths. For example, we consider that thread one goes this way, A, B, C, E, G. Uh, thread two goes uh, following this green path, A, B, D, E, G. Thread three, thread four. So as you can see, these threads diverge, right? They, they follow different execution paths. But recall that if these four threads belong to the same warp, they have one single common PC. We don't have a different PC for each of the threads. So how are we going to deal with this? Because at some point, we want thread one and thread two to be here, and we want thread three to be here, and we want thread four to be here. And that's not going to be possible, right? Because if they have the same PC, it's not possible that the four of them are in different parts of the code. Um, the way we are going to deal with this branch divergence or uh, intra-warp divergence is uh, very similar to the way that we, uh, we did uh, vector masking. You remember vector masking from the... Uh, the, the lecture uh, last week. Let's uh, see one example here. Um, we have, uh, in, the, in, in the beginning of the code, we have uh, all our 32 threads that belong to the same warp, executing in this uh, PC equal X, executing this instruction, and then uh, they reach to this branch instruction, and it turns out that some of them want to go through this path A, while others want to go through this path B. Only uh, they will reconverge in the last uh, um, stage. But as you can see in these uh, instructions here, in path A and path B, we have um, only part of the threads of the warp are in each of the paths. So how are you going to handle with, uh, deal with this? What we are going to do, as I said, is something similar to um, vector masking. Let me quickly show you one example here. So, Let's talk about mask or predicated operations. <laughs> Remember that um, in the example that you have seen in the slide, there was an initial block where all the threads were executing 
uh, at the same time, and then we find one branch. And it turns out that only part of the threads want, want to go through path A, and the other part of the threads want to go through path B. So what we will have to do here uh, in the branch, the branch will somehow generate a mask or a predicate register, Let, let's call it mask. And in this mask, we have one bit for each of these 32 threads. And maybe um, um, path A here is uh, the preferred one for this thread and for this thread and for this thread. So the mask will have initially this value, one, zero, one, zero, etc. So only this thread, this thread, this thread will execute path A. And next, what it's actually going to happen is that path B will be executed by this thread here, this thread here, here, etc. And what we need to do is to invert the bits, the bits in the mask so that this is zero, one, zero, one, zero. What the hardware will do is the hardware will, or the, in the CMD pipeline where we have all these vector lanes, we will have uh, in some way all the 32 threads going through this path and then all the 32 threads going through the, this path. But depending on the mask, the mask that we have here or the mask that we have here, we will only commit to the uh, output register the results corresponding to the active threads. So as you can see, the problem, I mean, this is the way uh, that we handle uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, divergence on the GPUs, uh, it's a way of solving this. The problem is that here and here, the CND utilization is uh, uh, smaller, is lower. So uh, CMD utilization or warp utilization is lower, it's not 100% because we are not using all the threads. So there are some ways or at least some uh, research proposals to deal with this. And one of them is uh, this dynamic warp form, uh, formation or merging in which what we do is that in case that in the same path, let's say path A, we have two warps that could potentially be merged because as you see, there are no colliding threads because here in warp X, we only have four threads. In, one, in warp Y, we only have three threads we could merge these two and generate like a dynamic warp, warp Z, that contains threads from X and threads from Y. Uh, this is another example. In this particular case, there is some overlap here, so it's not possible. But with this third warp here, we could finally have like three, uh, I mean, three warps in two warps. And, um, in the remaining slides, what we have in is a very good example of this. Uh, and this is the same uh, code, the same, yeah, the same uh, code that we analyzed before. We consider two warps, the blue and the orange or pink one. Uh, in path A, we can do uh, some merging here, as you see. In path B, uh, we could do probably some merging too. And this is a more uh, complete example um, uh, we have like two timelines, as you see. Um, um, on top, we have the baseline. This is the way that uh, these uh, warps uh, are going to go. These warps, uh, the, the blue and the red warp, 
are going to go through all these uh, different blocks uh, in the, the, the all the possible paths. And this is an example of, uh, of what would happen if we implement this dynamic war formation. Observe this, for example, this for, for the block B, we have, uh, um, uh, I mean, we could do some kind of uh, dynamic war formation here, but uh, still we cannot take full advantage of it because there is some overlap. But for example, for uh, the block C, it's, uh, we can uh, execute two warps in one, or here in D, in E it happens the same, in F, etc. So the good thing is that in the end, we are saving some time, right? Okay, um, yeah, just one last question. Because we have already seen a way of merging warps, right? Um, but can we move any thread flexibly to any other lane? That is, if it turns out that this thread executing here is active, but this thread executing here is, uh, is not active, could we somehow move thread from one lane to another lane? Maybe we could do it, probably uh, with uh, very expensive hardware, but in principle, this is something that we don't want to do because thread zero is working here with some registers and thread, uh, th thread one and thread two. Sorry, thread zero. Okay, uh, tomorrow we will continue. We will finish uh, the last slides with an example GPU. And, and then we will talk about uh, GPU programming. See you tomorrow.